Taste my game fix. Hello and welcome to episode uh, 89 of Taste My Game Face. Took me a moment there. I'm your host, this is the ADMO, joined today by Wayne James. Hello. Joe Knight. Hey. And Alan Heath. Hello. You I can- mean, like, it's fair to lose count when you've done this many. <laughs> like, we don't it. have an abacus by the screen or nothing. Oh, we could, just got to do. We could. just got to look, look for the scrap of paper what? that had the last one on and just... Why, have we, why have we not got an abacus? <laughs> Why would we have a fucking abacus? Because <laughs> it would add a certain retro. <laughs> <laughs> if we had an abacus, could it be wall mounted? <laughs> we could get a wall mounted abacus. And what we could do is we could like basically code our own games, but we have to put each frame in ourselves. But so what- you have like all the different rows of colored beads and stuff. And you just like slide them along until you've drawn a picture. And then you slide them along until you've drawn the next picture. This and- is getting overly elaborate. Yeah. What happens when we run out of beads? You don't. That's the magic of an abacus. <laughs> what is infinite beads? All you can slide beads. <laughs> well, what you do is you, like, you slide and then you just store that number at the end in your head and you start the top. Oh, okay. That's not going to help so, with this problem, is it? <laughs> Video games. They are a thing. That's what we're here for, right? Yes. So interestingly. Oh, I thought this was the abacus convention. <laughs> oh, Wait, that's <laughs> Tuesday. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> Constantly disappointed by being on this podcast, are you? <laughs> yeah. One day you're gonna. One day I'm gonna come along. And you're gonna talk about something that interests me. <laughs> well, today is not that day because Shit. today we're here to talk about video games again. And would it be abacuses yeah. or abacai? Oh god, <laughs> what a question! Abacuses. I think it. I think it's abacuses because it's Egyptian, isn't it? Not Roman. I'm just gonna go. There. <laughs> yes, Wayne. That is a definitive answer. It's, yeah, it may not be correct, <laughs> yeah, but it's for all of, it's... all of the points. <laughs> what so, is what is Latin plurals for two hundred? <laughs> so I heard, I hear the uh, two of you went outside. Uh, I mean, briefly, it was it was scary out there. I tried to keep it to a minimum, but uh, yeah, I had to like scuttle into the daylight for a small amount of time to get to the video games exhibit. Does daylight still burn? That's um, the question. I, don't, I, I haven't been out for a while. I mean, like, I waited till there was enough cloud cover oh, so okay. that, you know. Solid and, move. And, uh, and it's starting to get darker this time of yeah, year. Yeah, it's winter now, man. Like, <laughs> I just don't have to see daylight anymore. It's fine. You don't really have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we went to the uh, video games exhibit at um, the V&A at the moment. Um, and I was rather impressed by it, although it was a little bit short. Um, what did you think, Wayne? So yeah, well, I mean, we went on separate occasions. Yeah, yeah, um, we didn't go together, but we both was, had the genius idea of going. We, yeah, we did on yeah. Alan's suggestion. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was a weird one actually. Thanks for like, inviting me. <laughs> no, it like um, so Jim was just like, oh, let's do something on Friday, and I was like, okay, there's this video games thing on the VNA, expecting her to say, don't be so fucking silly. She went, all right, I'll book it. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I um, JP came to stay over the weekend, the guy that does the intro music for the podcast, and he wanted to go through the sights of London. And I was like, let's go to the Natural History Museum. And then he was like, I'm bored of the Natural History Museum. So I was like, I'm going to go to the video games exhibit. And he was like, I'm not. So it was just me. And he had to wander around the rest of the V&A. That's fair enough. Fair I mean, so, so like... It was very front loaded is my like is the key word that comes away from me. Like when I think about it, it's like you sort of walk in and there's a little bit of like, wow. One thing it's just sort of like joy and amazement that it's happening at all. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, video games being taken seriously in a gallery such as the VNA is, you know, quite impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is your, there's, your- um, like at, at that opening section there is like a a little kind of description of what the exhibition is and it is a kind of statement of people haven't taken the design of video games seriously until now but we are so that's what this is going to be about yes and like that's yeah that's like it it feels nice instantaneously just reading that you feel like people are I don't know it's more of the maturation of the medium that people are actually starting to look at it with eyes other than that that's a toy it's just entertainment rather than it means anything great it's, it's the same eyes we just became the eyes that people yeah, listen you, to <laughs> like, that's, how, that's how that is what you're saying is we got old yeah yeah we, yeah, we done got old <laughs> so like I'm 
like what was quite interesting is that what you said there was my takeaway or my response to that is equivalent to my takeaway from the back half of the exhibition Mm -hmm. and that people i don't know still view games through prisms that perhaps they haven't been conceived in or hasn't been relevant for a little while now at least a sort of few years um so like so yeah let's not do it in order so like the last half of the um the last half of the exhibition has a, this it's like the sort of disrupt element because the title mm-hmm. of the exhibition is like design play disrupt even though i guess it would be if you were walking through it and um, design disrupt play but uh, i guess that's irrelevant because that's the order in which the things occur as you're wandering through them but i guess it's not as fun um so but the disrupt element is like the sort of like no it works in that order it totally works in that order. Uh, someone probably like had a look at it. Or maybe they just moved the door. We're like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> We've printed all the POS now. Uh, yeah, 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 probably. <laughs> um, so it's like this, um, you've got like a wall of talking heads and they're talking about, they're being interviewed about the elements or talking points that have their little elements in that room in the gallery. So the sort of politicization, um, the sort of like, like why that we're so fascinated with guns in video games, the use of like females and minorities in video games and why they're so lacking mm-hmm. um, stuff, stuff like that. But when, when they were talking about them and I know it was this sort of like idea to be provocative when they were talking about this stuff, I kind of felt like all of the arguments, all of the discussions while important to have gave gave no heed to the positive achievements of games over the last like maybe two or three years to try and cover this um so there was quite a lot of oh you know we're sort of like ah oh, just stuck in shooting oh there's never any like powerful women in video games and you're like well hang on a second like we had the last ah, of us and we had uncharted and we had my experience of that was quite different because i'm i moved into that section um and those those talks were like the the big thing that was happening, like the kind of recorded dialogue of all of these different people talking about, yeah, like their experiences of video games. Um, but the games that they had around that were definitely showing that the problems that they were talking about were being really, really addressed. Um, I, I didn't think that they were saying they're being really, really addressed as much as, oh, someone's trying. Does that make sense? Like if, if you, when you take it as a package, mm-hmm. I understand that like, I mean, like I was possibly the best thing to look at in the entire exhibition and watch was the phone story um, mm-hmm. thing at Games Can Be Political was like really. So do you want to explain what that was? Um, yeah. So like one of the instances in this room, so like, like I've gone through them, but one of them is like can, Games Can't Be Political or something like that was the t- title because they're all, they were all quite provocative, you know. And they had a video playing the iPhone game. Yes, but briefly iPhone game. Yes, if I if I know correctly, um, called Phone Story, and it was effectively I've, what I can can see was a video of most of it. Right. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think it was all of it. In point of fact, yeah. So it was like, and it started with the sort of like exploitation of the people in the towers. One of the little mini games in it was catching people that are jumping off of the top of the is it foxconn that's the name of it isn't it i don't there. know i believe it's foxconn building in um is it india china china that's it the foxconn building in china where they produce iphones so you've got little guys and it's a little bit game and watchy you know you've got little guys with this little like um stretcher thing walking backwards and forwards trying to bounce people that have jumped off the top of the building and it has this and it has the um like you know pollution in a river people Mm -hmm. fishing bits out trying to recycle the goods and they're poisoning them at the time it's got people mining for the rare earth metals that are needed for it in um democratic republic of congo yeah um like yeah it's it, it it manages to gamify the the horrors that go into the creation of an iphone like that that game of catching people jumping off of the Foxconn tower at the same same time it's telling you that people are jumping off of the Foxconn tower and that <laughs> so many of them are doing so that they decided to come up with a solution to people trying to commit suicide there which was to put suicide nets up not to improve working conditions so it is 
it is a game to- t- telling you that you're a terrible person for owning the device that you have the game on. <laughs> it is, um, and, and, and it's all narrated by this sort of like bubbly robot voice mm-hmm. that's just there basic because they're... Um, and, it, and, yeah. it's, and it's all sort of pixel art as well. So, it, so it's a very gamey looking game at the same time as like telling you something kind of horrifying. Um, in fact, definitely, definitely horrifying. <laughs> um, but it's quite powerful. Because of that, and like there are a lot of different things that are shown in that area that were a powerful way of dealing with some sort of uh, important political thing. Like um, there's there's a whole section on, on Mafia 3, right? And now I hadn't played Mafia 3, but suddenly I feel like I want to No, I know. I came away of it from there <laughs> feeling like, oh, how did this go past me without right? noticing? Because <laughs> like... It's what is it set in? Is it set in the fifties? In the fifties, Louisiana. I yeah, right. And you're playing as a mixed race guy, and all of the cops are racist as hell. They're just out there like calling you the N word, like saying that there's like a coloured guy in the neighbourhood, and like, and it changes the speed of the response of the police to you doing something changes depending on the neighbourhood that you're in, right? And like, I don't know. It just it feels like it's. it's allowing you to experience a thing that well does still happen but like way less overtly in most of america now and like adds a little bit of context for why people are so goddamn pissed off there at the moment you do also get to like uh chain gun down a Ku Klux clan rally i believe in that game also though <laughs> <laughs> are they complaining about the holes in there <laughs> uh yeah so I don't know. Maybe I should play it. Um, and interestingly, um, Joe, you told me before about the games of Robert Yang, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of his games is there. Which one? Um, I can't remember what it's called. Is right? it the Dick Picks one? It's not the Dick Picks one. It's the one about washing a man in in the uh, in the sauna. Oh, shower buddies or whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah. that, that where you have to go to your computer at varying times of the day by your computer's clock, and then the man turns up, and then you can wash him, and then like the relationship starts to get frayed between you and the man that you're allowed to wash and then the man that you agree to wash at a certain time doesn't turn up anymore and then you get antsy about it so it sounds great so, we didn't so we didn't we, we if, didn't get that much an, if, it, it was if it's not the, obvious this game is is about being gay in in, in a very particular I, way i'd see that like when i saw when i saw him like discussing as part of the talking heads thing the sort of like oh, why aren't games sort of like about what we want? I'm like, I'm not sure of many games that are the equivalent for straight people. They exist. Oh, you I just mean, don't play them. Oh, is there? Is, yeah, is, there, there's a lot is of there? kind of like gross stuff. I mean, I would say that maybe a scathing, a scathing burn would be that like maybe it isn't as like recognisably artful. Okay. Like, due to the fact that this is like, as well as being that game, is also making quite a bold statement, you know, like at the same time. But like, I, I don't know. I, I think there's kind of, obviously that, because kind of with like, a, with a cisgendered kind of sex game, I guess kind of falls into that kind of like gross, in your head, you just think about it and you go, oh. But, but I then, don't like, know. If it's something that's making a political statement about something. Let's not else. be sex negative. I don't I mean, know. Like, I well, know. I, like, the, so this is this is the thing. This isn't about whether or not. It's the same thing. I don't see how. I don't see why there's not that sort of grossness within that as well. In terms of the gamification of it, I'm not talking about you know being I'm so desperate not to dig myself a hole here but i'm hoping everyone <laughs> understands what i'm saying right? i'm still lost it, you're in gonna the have sense to explain that, more so like joe said when you think about the idea of the gamification of like porn right you sort of go that's a bit odd right I, or, or i do yeah, instinctively yeah, so. that's a bit odd that was my instinctive reaction to seeing this it wasn't like oh look gay guys doing what gay guy likes to do it was that's a bit odd Okay, so I guess that my difference is, is I, that I guess it's how I got to Robert Yang's games, is um, I got to Robert, Yang game, Robert Yang's games through watching, like listening to him give lectures and talk about 
that particular aspect and about his thoughts behind it and i guess that's one thing that you could that you could say is i don't understand i i haven't sit down and listened to a lecture of anyone talking about the porn game that they might have made you know or what what the context actually is or how they feel about it or anything like that and because i've and i guess because i've heard him talk about it and he's a university lecturer <laughs> the um you know teaches people how to make games on a daily basis he has that kind of credence where i will like listen to yeah him. no yeah, I, I, you know and like that's i guess that's one thing where those other games are lacking i guess here's the thing like what when i so he was one of the talking heads and it was as part of the representation mm-hmm. and when i heard him discussing it about oh i don't want to be the guy that makes gay games i was like fuck it, there's not enough representation of like, you know, gay people in video games at all. I'd love to see those sorts of, you know, story-driven narratives, but, you know, with those sorts of elements involved, hell, we need people of different genders of sexualities, etc., leading our video games. When I went to the next room and I was like, this is just a weird fucking porn game, I was kind of disappointed. I was like, mm-hmm. that's not what I thought you meant. That's not the sort of game that I think anyone... Many people, it wouldn't be popularized in any way. I think putting it in a gallery gives it far too much credence for what it was. Personally, see, because like out of the out of the ones that I've dabbled with, is that isn't one of the ones that I've played. I've just heard yeah, yeah, talk yeah. of it, but he does do. He has done. I would say more kind of interesting stuff, like his game that is about essentially about being in a bathroom on a chat room trying to take different dick pics that people on this chat room are asking you to take whilst your mum is trying to come into the bathroom that then turns into a surveillance state my dick pics are being stolen from the internet by government is kind of doing something (laughs) like like something was definitely happening (laughs) in that game (laughs) I mean, there's an interesting twist at the very least. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, so what we haven't spoken about at all is the opening. Wait, wait, wait. We're working through this backwards and we haven't spent enough time in play at all. So interestingly, play, I spent the least amount of time in Uh by miles um, because the two games that interested me most there, I've already played. Yeah, so um, I so I, I got there close to closing, so I kind of rushed through a bit, and then I got to play, and I realised I had more time than I thought, because yeah. it was shorter than I expected. So yeah. I actually got to spend a little bit of time there, and that meant that I got to actually play a lot more Line Wobbler, a game that See, we've talked about on the podcast Line before. Wobbler, yeah. Like, I played this, uh, and I assume you may have done as well, because you've been to Berlin, Very, right? So oh, it's, no. It's at the um, Game Science Centre in Berlin. So it was um, at an uh, EGX Res um, a little while ago as well, um, so... Um, I, th- I thought you played it there. No, well, if I, I think I may have had a brief go, but it was busy. But at the Game Science Center in Berlin, I finished it. Ah. I've actually, so I've done it. So I was like, okay, it's kind of fun, but there's people around, you know, queuing to play on it. So we have talked about it. this I'm on the happy. podcast before, but it's a game that's um, essentially a strip of um, LEDs, um, which can glow different colors with a... Um, a doorstop at the end. That's basically what it is, isn't like it? Like yeah. a springed uh, doorstop. And by moving the doorstop one way, the uh, you will have a sort of coloured, you will have a colour of LED that is you, which can move along the strip. And by moving it the other way, it can move the other way. And if you wiggle it, you can't move, but you sort of um, stretch out and sparkle around and you can kill enemies that are coming. Yeah, that's your you. attack, basically. Yeah, that's your it's attack. a kind of dazzle attack. You yeah. Just, yeah. Um, but there's a lot of sort of layers and mechanic that can come from that. Um, and the game does a thorough job of exploring it. It's really quite a simple idea that's really surprisingly fun. I think, but I suppose when it's done, it's I done. I think it's as good as a one-dimensional game is possible to be. I, I It's as good as a number like it's hard to say it's like 
it felt like playing a quality platformer when mm-hmm. I played it. It's it's got and that they normally same have sort two of, dimensions. Yeah, exactly. But it's got <laughs> that or three. But it's got that sort of like you know tension, that idea of like perfection in your movement and mm-hmm. delicacy, and also trying to work out what's going on from all the things on first viewing. So and, I mean, Lime Wobbler is one of those things where I've heard it described loads of times. I still can't picture what the fuck it actually is. So. If because every you, time someone describes it, they describe it slightly differently. So I feel like I need to see stop, it. Yeah, you would, you might do. But the door stop enables you to move forwards and backwards along the line, which is normally done up a wall, right? So it'll be out in front of you and then up vertically. But it's just a line. It is just a line. And the line is back. The background color, if you will, is white. Um, I believe that your color is green, but don't quote me on it. But you are a dot. You Enemies. know what? I, I I mean, like I played it all of like a week ago, and I can't remember if you're green or not either. But I think you're right. Um, so pushing up on the doorstop moves you forwards, and pulling backwards moves you backwards. Enemies are red. Some of them are static. Some of them are motion, like moving. And if they're moving, obviously they'll just travel along the line in a pattern, like a standard platform game attack pattern. And, and to start with, most of them just kind of head towards you yeah well i think at the start there's just a few static ones oh you're right you're right but once they start moving they're just kind of heading down the strip so you've just got one red light that's moving down the strip towards your green dot and then to make sure that you kill it when it gets close to you you wobble the doorstop and you sort of spread out as a larger yellow kind of scintillating selection of dots and if that hits that red dot it gets rid of it right maybe you have to watch a video later no, yeah. that, that's as that's as about as or good effort as I'm ever going to do. <laughs> yeah, you should, you should. It, I, I don't know. Is it worth the entrance fee alone just to play? There's enough there, I think. I, I but know, definitely I... spend some time playing Lion Wobbler because when you first pick, when you first get to it, it's like, the fuck is this? <laughs> and then you get into it, and it's like, okay, this is absolutely genius. It is very, very worth hunting down and playing. And there's enough of Lion Wobbler there for you to definitely be able to get yeah, a chance got to play. Three, yeah. three there, haven't they? Mm-hmm. Um, but there are some other interesting little arcade games there as well. There was one that you couldn't play that just looked like the best thing in the world, which is like the the hard hats that have a button on the top, right? And oh, the yeah, idea yeah, yeah. is two people stand in a circle and they both have to try and hit the other person's button. When they hit the button, it's going to take a picture of them as well. So like you get a moment of victory that's then like frozen in time with your crazy victory face on as you manage to hit the button on the top of the other person's head. I think you get the point system for that game is also based on um, if your face is in shot when you hit the button. Mm-hmm. So in like forcing you to actually attack <laughs> front on because the ca- the ca- the two cameras are pointing forwards. So you have to be in the shot when you hit the button on your opponent's head. Mm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I do wish I'd have played that, but I fully understand why we couldn't. Yeah, I, know, like, I, know. I absolutely get why. We uh, I mean, when I went, it was broken. the Friday night late as well. So like people had been in the um, people had been in the main area. Mm-hmm just drinking <laughs> as well so you could just imagine like if oh, that, that thing was the out there that it would have lasted all of 15 minutes oh why why did they not do it they oh just crash mats and like ridiculous like sumo outfits and it would have been fine i mean they're already wearing hard hats <laughs> <laughs> yeah but those are oh, they would have gone flying you could just <laughs> you could just tell I mean, also they they put Quop in an arcade cabinet. Oh, they did. I didn't have a go at it in the arcade cabinet because I've played. <laughs> I've, I've Quop played before. it. I've played it a lot. I think I've played it on the phone first, and then I've played it as on Flash as well. And it's yeah, it's absolute fucking chaos though. So I love what's, it. What's the designer's name again? I've Bennett forgotten. Foddy. Bennett Foddy. Bennett Foddy made, makes games that are really really difficult to play. That is like his <laughs> aim in making a game. So Quop is. Um, for people who don't know about a well trying to run a race with all of the joints in the wrong places and trying to synchronize them oh, in the no. right order the, jo- the joints are in the right place you just have to move the different parts of your leg individually <laughs> there is a button for moving the thighs there's two buttons for the thighs one for left and one for right and then two buttons for the calves basically and those are q w o m p hence quop and yeah i mean it's absolute chaos but it, again it should be played by everyone not for very long though at least if so you an arcade like cabinet things. is probably perfect yeah an, an arcade cabinet is probably perfect but it's one of those games that if you spend too long at it at it you'll end up throwing something through the window <laughs> possibly yourself <laughs> 
just just so you can have some complete control of something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to feel. Um, but but anyway, like this whole space, it was all about like sort of an interesting play space. It was about designers doing things outside of the normal, just to kind of see what happens, like thinking about how you could have a mechanic that worked differently or have something that doesn't look like it, it could be used for video games, like a doorstop being made into a game. Um, and yeah, there's other interesting things there as well. Um, but yeah, we should get to the actual opening section. Yeah, as well, the design, maybe. which was the highlight for me. Mm-hmm. Um, the... Um, so there were about six or seven games, um, some of which were incredibly well known. And like you sort mm. of walk through the door and the first one that you're greeted with is Journey. And then um, The Last of Us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the first three games in there, and this is why I say it's front loaded, are Journey, Last of Us and Bloodborne. Mm. So you sort of walk in and you're like, whoa, this is cool. And then you walk around the corner and you've just got like fucking Joel and Ellie and this huge, like they've got a huge screen mm-hmm. playing a section of the game. And on one side, they're playing a section of the game. On the other side, they're telling you about the development of the game. Uh, so it's... Peculiar, uh, peculiarly enough, I didn't spend that much time there because I feel like <laughs> I've put my head so deep into The Last of Us before that there wasn't a vast amount for me to gain there. Um, the the stuff about Journey, on the other hand, like considering that it's a game that has narrative, tells emotion in like a really tangible way without ever saying anything to you, literally. Like it is about gameplay and creating emotion through gameplay. I was really interested in like seeing behind that, seeing what they were trying to design. The process behind that was really interesting. Like, Mm -hmm. because you can see their different attempts at it, can't you, as part of it. Almost my favorite thing in the exhibition is a is a spreadsheet that they've got there that shows you all of the emotions that they're trying to create along the journey and uh and i took a picture of it and i've been looking at it since and it's yeah like in really interesting um kind of following that path and seeing how they try to succeeded in fact at creating something so evocative without yeah ever the game ever saying a word to you yeah um so it was really really well done I, the uh, like probably my favorite bit in the entire front section um was actually their sort of like i guess poem poem probably but i can't think um that accompanied the cleric beast battle in bloodborne mm-hmm. <clears throat> i sat and watched the whole sat when well, you can't see it but oh. stood and watched the whole thing. You mean and you mean Matt Lee's talking is it about? Matt Lee? Yeah, that's Matt Lee's talking about Bloodborne. Is it just the, is it just from a podcast or something? No, no, he made it. He, it's just for the exhibition. It is just for the exhibition. Um, but I mean, he's got an excellent like let play of Bloodborne actually because he um, just ed- edits it down loads and loads and loads to kind of take out a few of the spoilers, but kind of give you his weird narrative of trying to work out what the hell is going on in that game um so i haven't played it but i watched him play all of it definitely spoiled it for myself um but yeah i mean that's the the first boss there's not a huge amount no, of right. spoiler in that but it's i didn't realize it was mad, but the the it's just right it's really engrossing when you have this accompanying the battle and like talking through what makes bloodborne so compelling um and it just describes it perfectly and it adds to what is even like a few years on really quite a spectacle to look at Mm -hmm. i mean that cleric beast battle is like you've played it haven't you yeah is an it's just a bewildering sort of like what is they call it eldritch horror is the word isn't it yeah yeah that's the buzzword that's the buzzword that people reach for and hell i'm here and also he had some like his (laughs) his animation the way that his like things he's like his kind of skin moves and his bits of fur move like i hadn't really seen anything like that no i know that was a new one (laughs) you know it's like one of those bosses that when you get to you're like oh that's a whole bunch of new technology and and yeah and just before (laughs) and well and just as you come to the end of that you're dead (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah then he's eating your face um they that that section of design also has a few smaller games in it and it kind of goes through those in interesting ways and it spends quite a lot of time with no man's sky as well and i think it 
it is really valuable that they put No Man's Sky there. I think their discussion of des- the design ideas behind that game are absolutely stellar. And even if you're not that keen on the game, like finding out about sort of their inspirations and what they were trying to create. And even though it took them a while to hit the mark, like where they were going and how they kind of try- tried to create a a cohesive look but one that is also incredibly different in different parts of their the the universe that they make like is thoroughly thoroughly fascinating um but no but like i i found the disrupt part to be like my favorite part of that exhibition and i would have liked to be able to spend more time there but Uh, but I, i think like i'm glad that i went and i think people that are interested in video games should go if only so that we get more of it yeah I think that's the key thing. I think it's very brave of them to do this. But when you go through, you're aware that they know that it's a bit of a risk or they feel like it's a bit of a risk because of the sort of limit in scope of it and et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's that we want to do this, but we're not going to make it sort of like massive and take over like a wing or anything. We're going to, I guess, be a little bit reserved about it and try and crack because it it's like it kind of starts to explore ideas without really going in on them occasionally mm. and that sort of thing. It, it kind of, it's, it says things like the, the bits of writing they've got down are, are all sort of talking about the, the, the burgeoning bravery of like viewing video games in this, in this different way, in this, in this way that like you say, Joe, we've been looking at them for years. Um, and yeah, it feels like they've just, they've only found a small space that they can do that with, or they only feel like they can, safely do that with a small space but hopefully this is just the beginning yeah fingers crossed Mm -hmm. but hey so there's also been another beginning this week was it last week when did it come out red dead 2's out anyway so we're gonna have a little bit of a chat about that none of us have played it though which is interesting we still have opinions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I now have to do that sort of newsreader thing. You know, when they go from like the fucking like panda frolicking to like breaking news, someone's just died in a horrific car accident thing. Like, and how, then, how do you do that? I mean, I know I, I see them do it all the time, but how do you yeah, do Yeah, I know. But this is this is kind of how I feel like because that like what? Well, first thing you do is you touch your ear. No, yeah. no, no, oh, no, no. That's it's only if it's... over the wire. Is it though? Yes. Hang on, can you is, say it? Is it though? They don't say that. <laughs> that is fucking... a... No, is hang on. What? Oh my god, what, what happened? happened? <laughs> is it though? <laughs> Just like a newsreader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now that's definitely fucked the severe sort of like going in, you know. And the, or at the very least, when you walk in from like you've been out. Right, or you've just got home from school and your parents have just found out what you went up to last weekend and they're waiting <laughs> and they've got that stern look on their face and then you've got to be like you've got to put like the frolic in with your mates or whatever to the side and be like oh, I've got to deal with this shit now yeah so so, so Red Dead 2 so um, there's been a lot of controversy around it and I think that's what we are going to discuss today because like I said none, none of us have actually played the game yet although Alan you have ordered it and it has not arrived. Yeah. And I hear you're not so sure that you want it anymore either. But yeah, it's one of those weird things where, like, you know, I ordered it, got the version with the, the cloth map because the cloth maps are nice. I mean, they are I, nice. I do, I do like that as a uh, sort of special edition edition. Yeah. yeah. Especially, no, I just call it a special Next edition. World artifacts are better yeah. often than, you it's know. definitely a preference. But yeah, as I ordered that and then. Uh, pretty much after you know having the money come out of my account and it saying it's on its way then reading the articles to do with the working conditions at rockstar and then getting this feeling of i don't know if i want to play this game anymore and then it gets lost in the post and now i'm in this weird limbo of i don't know if i want to play it but it's also not here so i can't even not play it for having it or whatever it's yeah, you've been Mental you've been limbo. disallowed to even make a political statement. Yeah, <laughs> so like, so this is interesting, right? Because um, I mean, the game's the game sold incredibly well, unsurprisingly. Is um, it? Am I right? I've been saying this a lot. Yeah, <coughs> has it been the highest grossing entertainment first two days of any product ever? I don't know. I will tell you this: FIFA outsold it in this country. Oh, did it? Yeah. I don't think that means anything. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to regret that shit. 
might already um, be doing so. Um, so, so I guess pretty soon, pretty soon before the game coming out, we had um, an article. I can't, cannot remember where it was published, but it was an interview Verge. with, with yeah, I think, I think so, the Verge, Verge. Uh, with with Dan. Was it just Dan Hauser? Yeah, yeah, where he talked about the fact that um, they've been working so hard at the game that they that some of them have even been doing one hundred hour work weeks. At which bragging point, about it. yeah, bragging about it, right? At which point, the game, the gaming universe went, "What? We've been talking so much about shitty working conditions. Now you're saying 100 hour work weeks? That's four days nonstop. That's without sleep." The best bit of that is that, like, everyone has been going. Working conditions in the video game industry need to change. Like this is the hot topic issue, and Dan Hauser is like living in a fucking shoe, bro. <laughs> like, I'm just going, yeah, oh, I fucking work hundred hour weeks. So I fucking love that shit. Like me and everyone I know. Like, and that is amazing. <laughs> he's he's a video game no, character wait, wait, wait. that likes Joe, Joe, that likes to think he's on the fucking. He pulse. can't be on the pulse. He's working one hundred hour work weeks. He can't be aware of anything else. <laughs> That is his life. Where was my Zeitgeist tape for this week? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, so nice. obviously that backfired. And like people were asking what the hell was going on. And Rockstar's response to this was to remove the media ban that they have on their uh, their employees just talking to any video game outlet. So like it, it, it is a rule that they have. Um, it appears that the reason that it's the rule is not to stop them talking about shitty working condition, but to stop them talking about the games that they're developing on. Yeah, right. Well, they removed the ban and all they've done is talk about shitty working conditions. Yeah. So but so we've I had mean, like that's... a couple of big long form articles like going into detail about the the experiences of those individuals. But it's because a lot of the people with the a lot of the people that have come forward and spoken about this, most of the ones that have been given negative information about the, the downsides of it have been giving it anonymously because most of the people that would want to do that feel like they have to because even though this blanket ban has been taken away, they feel they would still get some kind of... You know, the, you know, their jobs would be at yeah, risk. Yeah, I mean, or I mean, it's, it's more than that, though. Like the, a lot of the people that have been saying positive things have done so anonymously. I think most of them have because they feel like they don't want their positive experiences to be seen as a specific argument against the people that are having a rubbish time. Mm. Like it's just we're finally getting to see what's going on in Rockstar in all of the shades. I, I guess just. I mean, it's nice to be able to find out what's going on in there, but oh my God, it's horrible to find out what's been going on yeah. in there. There was like, I think the one one story that really stuck with me from reading it was put, went in the Eurogamer article. And there was a, a guy that said he was a, a new father, the newborn child that was he wanted to be around his family. So, you know, was like, okay, I'm going to work super hard during the week do my overtime on my weekdays, get on top of my work, get my bugs down so that I can have my weekend to see my wife and you know my newborn child. And then when it came time for him to leave and say, well, my work's done, bugs are low, I'm going to go home for the weekend, his manager would then come up and say, no, you can't go, you have to stay. So well, I've, I've done all my work, what, what you, you know, I've got nothing to do, I, I'm, I'm on top of it. When manager then goes away, comes back with a stack of work and say, here you go, now you have to stay. And then that person then proceeded to have to work the weekend and not see their child. Yeah, like, I mean, so after talking about these 100-hour work weeks, um, the the houses then said um, that, no, these weren't compulsory. <laughs> they were just talking about the people doing the writing themselves working that much. And that actually nobody else in the studio had to, and they used the specific term, work hard, because they seem to think that working long hours means exactly the same thing yeah. as working hard, which is concerning in itself. Well, I mean, there was quite a lot, of, quite a lot of the Eurogamer article was talking about that, you know, negative correlation between productivity and hours worked. So, I mean, we were talking about that a little bit on the previous podcast. Yeah, um, but it was interesting to hear it from those people as well saying you know i was there and there's also because of this sort of like cutthroat nature of video gaming as well there are there are people and this is one of perhaps the issues when we talk about unionization 
don't get me wrong, I still think it's a good thing. But there are those people who believe that presenteeism is the way to get promoted. And if everyone's going to be there till seven o'clock, then they stay there till nine. And then the manager comes in and says, well, why aren't you here till nine? Such and such is here till nine. And it sort of like creeps that way. And I've seen it in the corporate world as well. And I mean, lucky I can just say, no, fuck off, mate, <laughs> and walk out. Um, it's, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, it happens in teaching too. Fortunately, not where I work, people seem to be very aware that you can be very good at your job and just get it done a lot quicker. But I've definitely heard about like lots of places where they expect you to say for as long as possible, otherwise you're not working hard enough. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's absolutely wrong, but it's it's I guess it's because it's a really... It's one of those, I mean, it's called psychology because it's me and I'm not a psychologist, but <laughs> um, it's one of those heuristics things I would imagine, right? I, I can't possibly understand what everyone is up to and doing in any real detail. However, I can see this person when I arrive and when I leave and I can see an email from them two hours after <laughs> I've gone. Therefore, they're committed. It's just a kind of heuristic, right? It is, there's no... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and the thing is that when when managers have that, at least they have something. Mm-hmm. And because they know what some people are doing, then they know that they're managing effectively. But because they've formed that heuristic, there then becomes the problem that when they're asked to manage the rest of their team effectively, that's all they've got to reach for because it's the only thing that they can observe. Because so often throughout these articles, it was, well, it's fucking middle management, isn't it? That was so much of it mm. was it's middle management going, well, you clearly don't give a shit if you're not here. And he's like, well, hang on, look at all this. Yeah. Uh, and it's like so many stories as well. We've just like people doing their work, but then because they have to do this mandatory overtime, even though they're on top of it, just being like, well, I guess I'll just fiddle about with stuff. Yeah, I can imagine off. that's where the ball growth thing came about. Someone was just had time <laughs> and they had all this o- overtime that they had, they were already on top of their work. So I guess I'll just... See if I play with some balls, I guess. <laughs> but it's, well, yeah, I play with some horse balls. Yeah. But it's quite it's it's <laughs> weird because it sort of like what's the word subverts. I think subverts is the word. The expectation that we often have when we're talking about the conditions of work, like the conditions in the video game industry, um, and saying, yeah, well, you know, oh, it's crunch and we don't mind if games are being delayed and whatever. But it feels like that and the more I read about it like this and others and you know the corporate world it feels like actually maybe what we have is a problem with management it feels like what what I, I don't know I think there's another thing though that exists within that that's really important which is one of the things that video games has that um is similar to the exploitation and stuff that we already know about about things like the film industry which is like this conceit that we're doing you a favor that you're there yeah i think that's i do think that's part of the problem but more and more it feels like that's the attitude of it feels like that spread you're right i fully agree with you it does feel like you know but then when you think about internships and stuff like in you know all sorts of industries when you think about you know yeah unpaid years here and unpaid years there and all the rest of it and then you get on and you yeah exactly and then you're there for the next two years on minimum wage and when you're like well can i be paid for and it's like oh yeah we're giving you your break Uh, but it's happening in all sorts of industries and i mean as ever it's fucking capitalism isn't it but (laughs) end game (laughs) yeah 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 i mean like it's crashing down around our ears but it's doing so slowly enough that we won't realize until we're all dead like or dying not dead dying prematurely (laughs) <laughs> good old late stage capitalism yeah man um so yeah like it's i i i agree with you about the management thing like it seems like in fact a thing that has cropped up in talking about in things that i've heard about video game studios fairly often is um sort of management problems um sort of not understanding um how to keep studios funded and yeah how to make sure they're looking after their workers and making sure their workers are actually producing their best work right like but i mean there's so many ways that that could have formed like it i mean if if it's it it might it may just be that you know video games are still new right so people have been winging it for so long that now that it's time to actually like start working properly and sensibly they don't know how to do that yeah there's there's that 
it's the, the the weird evolution of with a lot of the people that we say that are in management or senior roles in video game developers now are the people that started their own studio and just made a game with five people in a mm. garage you yep. know in the 80s or early 90s and those are the people to you know in charge now and but their mentality when starting up was that was you work all hours you get it done you because it's like we just need to get this shit and then the flip is the people that actually are managers and like have that training are, you know, the executives at EA and Ubisoft who don't understand video games enough yeah. for us to be happy about what they want to produce. Yeah. So you're fucked either way. You're fucked Pretty either much. way. Yeah. Or your media molecule. Or your we, media uh, molecule. Yeah, and then we can call Or you're owned by Sony. And you know, like, I mean... You Not know, necessarily true, for, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm still looking forward to playing that new game that Media Molecule have got coming out, you know, and it's probably going to be worth waiting for. So here's the really important question then. Who's going to get Red Dead? I'm fucking not. Well, I wasn't going to anyway. Uh, like, let's... As, mu- as much as I would love to say I don't have Red Dead, uh, fuck Rockstar because look at the way they treat people, I haven't enjoyed a Rockstar game since GTA 2. So I wasn't going to get... I wasn't going to get Red Dead. You've been chasing that dream though. <laughs> Uh, no, I have occasionally picked one up or borrowed one normally off of you to play it and go, is this actually any good then? And then I go, no, and do something else for I, lo- I, I love how like in your mind memory, like the, 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 the Wayne view of everything is like, Grand Theft Auto 2 was the greatest thing. <laughs> that Grand Theft Auto 3, the thing that changed the face of fucking video gaming forever and created and was the first thing that ever really delivered like a seamless open world or, you know, like really created, you know, like made us feel free in any way, shape or form. <laughs> That's where they fucked it. That's the that, that's, they, that's where it went it, wrong. That's when they dropped the ball. When they <laughs> let go of the gang system look, from look, GTA two. Look, that look. was the moment. <laughs> I mean, I agree with you fundamentally on that particular <laughs> issue because the gang system in Grand Theft Auto two is fucking marvelous. Let's like, I appreciate those things. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate your like again. You're right in terms of yeah, what what they did you know what that did to move the industry along at that time but the gang kind of system no <laughs> no not but the gang system though but fundamentally it's just not a game i want to fucking play there's lots of like <clears throat> it's taken me fucking 15 years to enjoy a 3d platformer for fuck's sake no, it's like true. i've not I'm, I'm not gonna say what like, was it like, super I don't... mario 3d land was the first one that i ever remember you talking any super, sort of super mario 3d land and even that feels a little bit 2.5 i think odyssey's feels like the first fully 3d um platform they finally got there that i, I mean, really like... enjoyed but that doesn't mean i'm not gonna say mario 64 was worthless or <laughs> I, and that's yeah um, um i can't believe that like that you, you should just cut that out and put it in my face and just make it a five second youtube you clip write it. You just me. Write it. with that um, <laughs> and then i'll never be able to work in any sort of video game media at any point in my life it'll be amazing um so but <laughs> I'm not going to say that the things that inspired it I di- aren't, ha- don't have value. Of course they do, but it doesn't mean that it has to be a game that I actually enjoy playing. I can still see the value of them outside of my enjoyment playing them. And I'll look at them as art pieces or over someone's shoulder or just read a fucking book about them. Well, that, I mean, even for me, like with, I mean, going back with these just generally with Rockstar games, I've always found that the vibe of their games was something that I didn't necessarily get on with. Like there was a tonal thing that they had for like all, all for the entirety of the franchise that I wasn't really into. I think Vice City was the first one I saw that I was like, "Oh, this looks interesting," just because of the '80s aesthetic of it all. Yeah. But then Red Dead Redemption came along, and Red Dead Redemption is one of my favorite games of last gen. I got super into that game. I re- I loved it, and that's why it kind of breaks my heart a little bit that this game is like like tainted. Yeah. I don't think I either like even if my copy does arrive and I do put it in and start playing it and wait for however long it fucking takes to install because it's a million gigs. <laughs> it's like 82 gig download or something yeah. like day but, one patch of yeah. But I thought that was just the install file. That's no, just the install file I think <laughs> okay. I'm just taking them. Although can you even fit that much on the Blu-rays? 
Yes. I thought they were 50. Oh, but, but it will... Um, uh, what, do they, what do they call it? It'll expand in size as it, as it installs. Oh, it's zipped. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Decompress. Even if, I, you know, even if I do that, I will feel like my enjoyment of the game would be tainted just by thinking about what people went through to make it. I'm going to get it. I kind of got to know. Are you going to get it if, if Alan sends his back so that the sort of net? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, right. The The fact is, well, actually, first of all, it's completely unjustifiable, but I'll explain my reasoning anyway. Okay. Okay. Right. I think that the sensible thing to do is to not get the game. Right. I think the only like reasonable thing to do is to not get the game. Um, on the flip side, it's sold gangbusters, right? Like it, it is a success. Like that is f- absolutely definitely what's happening, and I kind of I kind of have to know like what all of the effort, the blood, sweat, and tears, like the fucking broken relationships, families, and people like has produced, right? Yeah, but no, man, I, I that's that's it's, that's, that, it's that, like it's that like the pyramids. <laughs> it's like the no, pyramids. Fuck the pyramids, mate. <laughs> You're like going into what is it, De Boers or whatever, and saying, give, give me the biggest bloodiest diamond that you've got (laughs) i just want to see if it shines yeah exactly (laughs) i want to see if it was worth it frankly like because all of these people have died and shit and there's slate and there's you know all these camps and stuff but it must be good how many people died how many people it must be good because i mean why would they have done it (laughs) but what what i want to know if it wasn't good what i want to know is is it better than the pyramids is it better than the pyramids (laughs) is it better than the pyramids (laughs) I'm never going to find out. <laughs> well, I might do because you'll probably tell me. And then I'll borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I borrow <laughs> your blood diamonds, please? <laughs> um, I just want to know if they were good. <laughs> I want to see if they're shy. No, but um, so, I mean, uh, we, I think we've said this already, but if it wasn't on the podcast, the developer, the developers and designers and all the rest of it themselves have said, you may as well buy it because we've put all of this into it. Also, they get bonuses. I, I, yeah. I have feelings. <laughs> Still like doesn't about really make it right. To the contrary, because I would. I know this is this. This kind of feels like I'm putting myself in a different, in an interesting position. But I always think that if you then ask that person, would you want someone else to go through that? If their answer to that is no, then you probably shouldn't buy the game. No, so... Because you're not encouraging the no, business practice I, that so, begets itself. I mean, again, I've said this a lot. I do broadly agree with you here. Um, but the... I, I, one, I wanted to state it for the record in case we hadn't. Um, but the other point is that it's kind of like... Because we didn't know about... Uh, there's lots of people that didn't know about it beforehand. It's already sold, etc. Making a noise about it and saying no more being pub you know set, posting on your social media posting on their social media and saying this is the ro- last rock star game i'm buying because i've pre-ordered it or whatever etc might make more of an effect because the sales aren't going to drop enough for them to go ah, fuck we'll, we didn't get away with that a, a, a devil's I mean, advocate i mean like considering how completely blind to like the state of the argument about worker conditions in video games Dan Hauser obviously was I feel like the backlash to this to to these statements is I mean it they're not going to be able to ignore it are they it's going to make them rethink what's going on like whether or not they change like they will damn well have to but it's have a serious also, think I mean, about what's one, going on. One of the difficult things with this is that, I mean, with a lot of the stories that we hear, we don't know exactly what studios they came out of. Mm-hmm. And Rockstar has a lot of studios that are all working on, or were working on yeah. Red Dead Redemption too. I mean, or they all still probably are. Probably are still crunching yeah. on it. I mean, let's but, not forget that they made most of their money from GTA V from the stuff that they sold after the game had come yeah. out. like the online mode, yeah, which yeah. they're obviously still incredibly hard at work on that because it's when it launches it's launching in beta mm-hmm. not even gonna be a full launch when that comes out but mm-hmm. there are loads there are loads of stories where it seems like there are it sounds as if there are pockets of rockstar that are really badly managed and people fucking hate it but they do it because they're like having a rockstar game on your cv is something that they find you know like this is an industry leading developer i want to be part of that sort of thing i'll go through hell to have that 
but then there are other pockets where it's like, oh, it's fine working here. Like, I don't know what, what are all these people complaining about? This is all right. And it's, I don't know, it's sort of affecting an entire company. Even if, so, you know, for example, even if it was that people said, we're not going to buy it and the sales for this were really low, that would be like, okay, so that's affecting this pocket and this pocket. But what about all of these people? That for them, it was like, this is just game development. Yeah, I, I mean, like the, for those people that you were saying at the start, like, oh, you know, we'll go for it because it's it's on the CV, etc. Like, I just can't help but feel like they're part of the problem, in the sense that, like, so so much, so much, like the phrase "worse well, the way the world is now" in it is is just basically it's kind of why so little changes is why progress feels so glacial so much of the time and i kind of just want to be like fuck you i hope you lose your job you know like i hope you're not good enough when people do that because you're fucking it up for everyone else because you're the person that's providing the heuristic that's making think, the management i bad. think i think there's a difference between be uh putting yourself and in that position and actually having a think about this, the real effect that's going on. I doubt that people are jumping into Rockstar and going, oh, it'll be hell for a short while and it's going to mean that other people no, in this but, company oh. are going through hell for a short while, but then I'm coming out with it with a... Uh, with that uh, with that game on my CV they're probably thinking this is going to be really difficult but I'm going to gain a lot of skills and, th and that's as far as they're thinking mm. but people do stick around with Rockstar because of yeah how but it's that's it it's the cachet that's yeah. the thing people because really people like oh, just go fuck you when it was like oh no we're doing we're doing Saturdays mandatory and every other Sunday you'd be like no go fuck yourself I'm sorry I've got better things to do in my life I don't and, care and and how much overtime are you going to be paying me no oh, no I'm gone <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> like, seriously yeah, well, there's the weird there's the difference between there are some people that work there and they're paid by the hour and they do get paid for overtime anyone on salary doesn't I, and, and it depends I hope the bonus is all right well it also depends on the on the um, law in the country um, that that particular Rockstar Studios in mm. right Right? Like, I mean, they're going to be treated better here than they are in, in America, probably in India yeah. as well. Yeah, I don't know what the fucking <laughs> it would be like in India. Yeah, I mean, like, there weren't, there were no stories that came out of India. Yeah. Like, people reached out, but Rockstar India didn't say anything. So, mm. I don't know. Yeah, take away from that what you will. <laughs> yeah. Taste my game face. So, Wayne, Dicey Dungeons. Yeah, Um. so you know how I only play games that are like two plus years old at the minute yeah uh -huh. i've decided to go completely the other way and play games from the future yeah exactly and i'm now playing a game from the future i'm playing a game that's... Uh, this this is what you can do with a physics degree <laughs> wayne where's my hoverboard <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately uh, dicey dungeons doesn't have a hoverboard and it gives me no clue as to when we will get one okay um but yeah so <laughs> So, yeah, what I've been playing is, uh, yeah, Dicey Dungeons, which is a um, currently in al alpha. So it's um, available on itch.io. You can play up to alpha version 10 for free on there. Um, and if you pay, you basically, it's like early access. And um, it's by um, Terry Kavanagh with music by Chipsall. So... Uh, fans of Super Hexagon, will which be, we are, which we are, will be interested. There is, will prick up straight away. In I fact, guess I we heard... know what's probably going to be the ending music of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first, uh, I first heard about it actually because I'm subscribed to Chipsel's Bandcamp, and um, she sent a mail out on there, and you know, said that it was said that this game was underway. So I went and had a look, and. Well, you know how I'm not really a fan of procedurally generated games. We've spoke about it at length for like two two of the last three episodes, right? Yeah, there was. I was really annoyed with our conversation about that last time. <laughs> I was trying to make a particular point, and I completely lost it in my <laughs> rambling way. I cannot remember what it is now. I was really annoyed. I wasn't on it because I wanted to say this: Diablo is good. Yes, that might be. Yeah, <laughs> it's debatable. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Did you see Diablo 3 coming to Switch and it's got an amiibo? 
I knew all of those things apart from the amoeba, but let's listen to him <laughs> talk because let's not go sidetrack down that, that amoeba hole. But normally, normally when I do talk about a game in part two, though, I, I, I like at least the last two times it's happened, it, I've had three separate timestamps. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wouldn't I, like I'm prepared mentally if that's what happens. Well, well, well done, Wayne. I almost got you immediately back on track. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd, you know, I, I, um, it's just like if if it happens, it happens, and I'll 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 cope with it somehow. Shall I put so, in another marker then. <laughs> Wayne talks about the fact that he's talking about the game again. <laughs> now you just have to talk about yourself talking about the fact that you're talking about it. I, oh no, I can't. I can't. You have to do that, and then I can talk about the fact that you're talking about me talking about the fact that I'm about to talk about the game, and it's a lot easier for me to cope with in my own head. So not anyway, mine, not mine. I'm lost now. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So, um, yes. it's an alpha. It's out in alpha at the moment, um, and it's like, like I say, it's like early access. So you can go onto the itch.io page of Terry Cavanagh. You can pay about five pounds. It's in dollars, and the conversion rate's fluctuating all the time at the moment due to Brexit and news related to it. So who can fucking say how much it'll be in pounds by the time you get there? All of them. Yeah, it's like it's about six seventy nine, I think, something like that, um, in dollars. Um, and that was amazing, Wayne. You managed to say Brexit and then not talk about Brexit. Well I done. I did talk about Brexit. I made a really good fuck. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, Wayne. Keep going. Oh, yeah. it, Eyes I on the prize, it. Wayne. Eyes on the prize. <laughs> I got you again, Wayne. Um, so it's um, so, and you can just download the current version, basically. And yeah, so you know how I was saying about procedurally generated games, and I'm um, you know not such a big fan of them. Because I'm not. If you've ever played board games with me, you might have seen me go say something along the lines of fuck dice rolling. Oh, yeah. Every once in a while. This game is both of those things. And I fucking love it. I absolutely love it. Is that it's, entirely due to the fact that Chips was written the music? No, I can because understand I that. played an alpha before um, one of the free ones before Chips was music was integrated. And I played it through twice. Oh, I, now that the now that the music's been integrated since I got it like two days ago, I've played it like eight times. <laughs> I've completed it like eight times, and the reason why it's reasonable to do that is, I mean, there's stuff that I hope changes. Um, I'll say that now. It's not like a flawless victory by any stretch of the imagination, but. So you're a character, your character is like a little dice and you've got different types of dice. So you've got like a warrior. You, so you at the start you select and this selection is also based on your difficulty. So you've got like a warrior, a robot, a thief, um, an inventor, a witch, and then a jester. So the robot are... seems like a man out of time among those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's, well, there's I mean, if you look at yeah, if you look at what the inventor's oh, okay. got, it's not necessarily like Da Vinci style. Oh, okay. It's yeah, it's a little bit more modern as well. But it's each of these like these little avatars in their sort of like two D animated sprites with about six frames, um, you know, plonked on a board. They all have very different ways of playing the same basic game. So. You're dropped on a map. The map is procedurally generated, but there are always going to be, at least in current state, five tiers. So you descend through the five tiers of the dungeon. Mm. Um, you click on a click on a square or circle, I guess they are, but you could click on a tile. That's probably the best word to go for. And you move to that tile. So some of those tile... Actually, let's talk about the battles first and then all the rest of it will make a lot more sense. If you click on an enemy... You go into a battle screen. The battles, as well as having awesome fucking music, but I, I, I mean, I've just said Chips will did the music. We probably don't need to discuss that again. We all know it's going to be amazing. Um, and do you get these like this wild variety of enemies, like absolutely insane things? Like, um, what have we got? Like marshmallows. We've got magicians. We've got like snowmen all sorts of random nonsense just like as their little animated forms um echo birds there's just these wild range of things you click on them it comes up and some dice appear on your screen and your first thing like there might be a tutorial i didn't click that button if there is one 
your character has some dice and some boxes with some squares on them. So the boxes are the moves that you can do. And the moves are triggered by dice values. Some cases, the effect varies based on the dice that you use. So for example, one of them is like, it will do one status effect if you throw an even number and a different status effect if you do an odd number. Or this does more damage depending on the higher number that you put in it. Um, Or there's other um, things like it might be that this, it might, the, the same things might be true, but they're also limited so, for example, you can only put an odd, odd number dice in here, or you can only put an even number dice, or only a six, or only a pair, for example, on this card to trigger the effect. And when you trigger the effect, the card in most cases disappears, and that attack goes to the enemy. When you've played all of those dice, then you click the end turn button, and your opponent gets a turn. So it's like, you know, it's like a turn-based tactical battle, <coughs> but with dice rolling but that's fun enough but where all the real beauty comes in is how all of the characters collect these cards that they can place their dice on so some characters will have a standard backpack you click on certain tiles on the map you can pick up a pick up an item and you get the chance to either keep or discard it or equip it etc And if you have space in your equipment tray, then you can drop it in. And then you can use that in any of your things. Or, um, so you're then looking, as you level up, you get more dice as well. So what you're doing is you're looking for the way that you can basically optimize the sets of cards so that you can deal with any given scenario, any dice roll with the number of dice that you're expecting. There's no point putting something that's, you know, um loads of things that are just requiring high numbers because you're not always going to get high numbers unless you've got things that like modifiers that enable you to do rolls or flip the dice or do combat like you know change the numbers so but there's also not just this standard equipment thing then you've got all of these other characters that have other ways so the thief for example has a limited backpack but can steal one of the opponent's cards So every turn you've got something else that you're not going to be able to know how to deal with. Or um, the witch has, when you collect cards, they go into your spell book. Before you can even play, before you can even use a card, you have to cast a spell by rolling the number associated with that spell to move it into your active tray. So you have a wider range of things. So for example, if you've got, if you throw a one, then there'll be, you will have a spell associated with one or one of these cards associated with one. And instead of using that one on an attack, you can use it to bring that spell out so that you can use it in a future attack. And then other characters have ways that they can just, the witch as well actually has this way that she can just throw the die. And that does a bonus point of damage if you've got nothing that you can use. Yeah, you just dash it at your (laughs) opponent if there's nothing that you can, if there's nothing else that you can do. The most compelling, though, is the one that's still in Alpha, which is the Jester. The Jester has a sort of trading card approach. So the same, all of the attacks are the same, but how they're presented are different. So, um, or the range of cards available are the same. With the Jester, you can have as many as you want, as many attacks as you want, but you only get, um, I think, two, maybe three dice any point throughout the game the way that you get more is if you have so from your card deck you get three in play at once if any of those are a pair you can bin them and get another dice so what you do is you try and optimize your deck so that you're going to be getting pairs out so that you can trigger them so that you can throw dice at other um throw dice on those other attack cards so that you can get more pairs so that you can eventually get to your effective like sort of like super power one um which is at the end and is a reusable card and as long as you've got dice spare you can do extra and bonus damage all the way through so there's all of these different mechanics so each one of these playthroughs is excellent and the thing is although the dungeons are procedurally generated 
they're not massively dissimilar from one another. You get the same amount of enemies at the same level, but you get a random one of those enemies. The cards that you will pick up will be random, but, you know, you'll still get at least one or two opportunities to pick them up. So those complaints that I had about being able to hone your approach and work on your skill basis um, don't really apply in this instance because although it's procedurally generated and the map's slightly tweaked and all the rest of it and the paths are slightly different, you're still dealing with a very a very similar problem. The sort of optimal approach and you're, what you're doing is you're getting a knowledge of all of these cards through your different playthroughs so that you can get further the next time. And even if you die on this enemy rather than that enemy on a playthrough, it still feels like very much the same. But the other thing is it's it's short, perhaps a little bit too short, but it is short enough that you don't feel aggrieved if you die and have to go back to the beginning and restart it and play it again. To- so I'm like thinking about this game. I th- like, do, is it something that you, is, is it, is every time you load it up a one shot? Or is there anything that carries over, which kind of has been the the vibe of... Uh, it's all a one shot. Okay. I, yeah. Like um, a Spelunky run. Yeah. I don't know if I want there to be things. I would ra- I don't know if I'd rather <laughs> the game itself brought like a, a single playthrough broadened slightly between now and then, rather than having other stuff on top of it. Because this short and sweet, I'm going to load this up. I'm going to play it. It's going to take me approximately 20 minutes, half an hour to just play through one go so of that, it. That's the peculiar thing, because I, I was going to say that Into the Breach has pretty short runs, but a short run in the, Into the Breach is, you know, still three and a half hours. No, right? this is, this is it doesn't feel like it's stolen your time if so you get that, deep and you die. It sounds like it would be like something that would be good for phones, like a I'm lost on the toilet game. Yeah. You know, that oh. one where people are like knocking for you and you're just like, two minutes. Yeah, I think it would work really, really well as a mobile game. I don't I know if it's being... say really well as a toilet game. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know if that's in the plan for it. Like well, I say... Oh, if it's, I mean, you said that it's in alpha. Is it possible that this is almost just like a small taster level almost of what a full game would be? Because I know quite a lot of the time they would do that where it's like, okay, if, for example, a racing game, the alpha is like <laughs> a couple of cars, a couple of tracks, but the full game would be lots of tracks, lots of cars. It's very possible. Um, reading the dev blog, it, it, I get the impression it it feels like everything that's been developed is in it. But that may just be that everything in the dev blog is in it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And there's a bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes that will be dropped. But I don't know if that's the way that he works. Really? Um, I mean, like the two Terry Kavanaugh games that I've got experience with, uh, Super Hexagon and... My favourite to say, viv, 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 viv. <laughs> like that, like five vives. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Is um, like they're very like. Did he just th- accidentally delete the RM off the end? <laughs> <laughs> they're very simple, but I mean, I, but they've always had a progression element to them. You know, that's something that I've always seen in his work. Is always he's someone that's always been kind of about mastery and challenge and do, is is that something that comes through in the characters the progression rather? is the difficulty yeah. scaling yeah so each of those are characters they, have, they are marked as being harder than one another it's and this is one of the other things At which the moment, one is the hexagonist one um the hexagonist one is the witch and it's the only character that i've not beaten the game as okay. yet i've beaten the game on hard mode which is a very simple hard mode it just bumps up like the stats of the enemies and gives them souped up versions of the cards. But I've beat that on like with the easiest two variants. I've not tried it on the other two and I find them probably the least compelling difficulty three and four, which is why I've not gone back to them so much. Um, But difficulty two, I don't think I've mentioned yet is the robot and the robot, instead of getting a dice or a number of dice based on your level, you have a CPU counter. You click a button and it throws a dice the number goes up on the CPU counter. And then it's a little bit like Pontoon. If you roll higher than your CPU counter, then all of your cards disappear. So you can play them en route, but you if you can't hold it. So say, for example, you've got a card that does damage based on the dice that you play, die that you play on it, right? 
and you're like, I want a six. Well, if your maximum CPU is, say, 11 and you've rolled to seven, you're not going to get a six. If you get a six, all your cards are going, boom. And it's like, well, do I risk just getting like a three would be perfect here and I've got three CPU left. Do I risk throwing a three here or do I or do I just take what I've got and deal with it? There is a sort of so there's that sort of push your luck element and it encourages you to that even further by if you get it. um, If you get it spot on, if you hit your sort of pontoon, which varies as you go up the levels, you get. Um, you get bonuses. You get to pick a bonus. It's like a limit break sort of thing. <laughs> and so you're like, oh, I only need a three, but if I get the three, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they, um, and that's probably the most fun one. But having done it on hard mode, there's perhaps not as much of a draw to come back. Whereas The Witch is the one that I'm playing on at the moment because I've still not done it because it is that, that spell casting uses, consumes so many dice that it's so hard to actually get the damage in. That you Does need. it take you through like quite a good progression through those difficulties? Um, well, the thing is that they're also very dif- different. Each of the characters plays quite differently from one another. So although the core mechanic is the same, so you're not going to be conf- too confused when you s- switch on to a different one. It's a different type of challenge, which is why um, I think I'm finding it so fun. It's not simply do this, but harder. It's like do this with this entire tweak to the way that it works that makes it harder. And that's what, yeah, I think keeps drawing me back. But it's I do- an interesting way to do difficulty levels. Yeah. Where it's not just like, oh, these guys are bigger bullet sponges, hit harder or whatever. It's like, no, the, the mechanics have been tweaked to make it more challenging. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's really good for that. I, um, I, I, I'm a big fan of this approach. Uh, like I say, I, I hope it's there's more, either more difficulties or more levels, or perhaps the dungeons are a little bit deeper when it moves from alpha. I mean, I from knowing how Terry Kavanaugh deploys his games and how his games form and grow. I would assume that this being an alpha is an incredibly deliberate choice on his part. I think so. And I think one of the other things that I should do, although I kind of am doing it now, right, is provide that sort of feedback. That's one of the things as being part Mm. of early access that you get a chance to see something while it's still in development. So who knows? Maybe we'll get this deep in the podcast and share it with everyone and then we'll be super popular. (sighs) about time oh, dude i don't dream, even right? know if i don't know if I, I could talk to terry kavanaugh <laughs> like i'd just be standing there being like As, super yeah, ex- ex- <laughs> you literally made the game that is the coolest one of all of them <laughs> <laughs> without doing anything <laughs> <laughs> but no i'm really excited to play it like it sounds really good like i quite like that because a little bit of a, a little bit I, I like that kind of um mystery dice rolling vibe in that way that you know i've always kind of like the liar's dice game you know kind of having an idea of the number that you need in your head and then like taking that roll and going like yeah right this is these are the ones these are the numbers (laughs) and like like rolling with that and like you know uh, maybe that's like the closest i ever get to gambling (laughs) maybe that's my thrill thrill lifestyle but um and also, you had me at Terry Kavanaugh and Chips all. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> all, everything since then. Like, has it's, it's just, just been white been noise? It's not white noise. It's a deep chip tune <laughs> and, like, bliss euphoria state that he's been in. Yeah, I mean the, the music is is magical. So if you've got if you've got that, at least it hasn't been an entire the, waste. The, the the real problem I have here is that like now I know about this game and it's in it's in alpha. I really want to wait till it actually comes out. But also I now know that I can get it now. So it's going to be kind of problematic for me to wait long enough for it to be complete. Unless he writes that he's going bust and might not be able to fund it, I would recommend holding on. Because I feel like the complete package is going to be a joy to hit first. And I do think as much as I've done it and it's you know not the first early access game I've played either... 
I do feel like it takes some of the impact out of that first loading of the complete package when you play a game in development. As much as I, I've enjoyed this, I, I think, you know, it is going to have hurt my first loading of it when it's done. There's a, there's a vital question that follows from this, though, which is how hype are you for grip? Well, that's out next week, isn't it? Yeah, man. I, I haven't touched it for a while. I mean, I, I, I own be- it and have not touched it. <laughs> <laughs> simply because I that that sort of like, oh, this is what it is now. I want to be a thing. I am really looking forward to it. As I said at the time, with reservations, because when I first played it, it was good, but not great. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that all that's been ironed out, but I haven't played it since because I don't want to not play it when the full game's released. Not want to play it when the full thing's released. I, I really, really need to know from both of you whether or not it achieves pure roll cage. <laughs> because like, that's, that's, a, that's a huge thing. Mm. But we'll should find we, out when we next should, week. Is should it we, next week? Should we all sit down here <laughs> next weekend and play group together? I think we probably should. No, you've got roll cage, right? <laughs> 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 Why would I do that? <laughs> but but I don't have a working PS1. Oh, wait, no, I don't need one, do I? No. PlayStation 1 games work on everything, don't yes. they? Yes, not, well, not PS4, but if you've got a PS3, that's fine. Roll cage is right behind us, by the way. I'm sick. I guess we know what we're doing after this. Yeah. Roll cage. <laughs> um, so... There's a game that you've been playing as well, Joe. Yes, yeah, new. So, so why don't we get to that? So new. As so as of this moment, yeah, this this game came out less than twenty four hours ago. The Quiet Man. It's not quite as good as playing a game from the future, though, is it? No, it's not because you also completed that one. I've also completed this game. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that uh, was quick. That's kind of its billing. So. What the quiet man is is, and do bear with me. <laughs> it's a FMV game, and now I've got to stop straight away, haven't I? Because we, it's not really a genre that we cover very often. On yeah, this people podcast. probably don't know what FMV Last means anymore. Last time we ever talked about it was a long time ago with her story, right? right. Mm-hmm. Um. And so an FMV game is something that uses full motion video or like, I mean, it's much easier to just put in it live action scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to kind of tell its narrative. Now, what The Quiet Man does is it tries to bleed that badly with a brawler. Like, and because that's what you think, isn't it? It's when you think, when you're sitting there and you're going, I've got this really good idea for an FMV game. What it's going to be is, and it's going to be, oh, you've got the act and they're doing they're doing acting and we're going to get this one guy and he's going to look exactly like Leonardo DiCaprio when he was in Romeo and Juliet in the 90s we're going to get that and then and then halfway through a scene we'll just cut to normal video game and then the man punches him in the face and then we go back to the live action unless we haven't worked out that set and then we'll just render that in CGI whatever we want (laughs) and that's kind of (laughs) The bipolar nature of it. It's all it it it's this, got this no. This sounds like a glorious clusterfuck, though. <laughs> and that's that's actually kind of why it, it, it's important. And it's so Square Enix have released this, and I'm gonna say this, and this is a deep cut, but they've already made one bad brawler, the Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, man. back as a it's I've effectively compl- a PlayStation forgotten. 2 tech demo. Uh, this is maybe worse than that <laughs> as a game. Yeah, as a as a kind of concept, like actually as a concept, it's rather difficult. So our main thrust of the story is our protagonist is is deaf. He like he can't hear anything. Like so characters talk and talk and talk and that's really long when you can't hear any of the words that's happening in your full motion cutscene that you've decided to do with real actors <laughs> and script and do um without me being able to hear it uh and this is where my first big problem with the game kind of hits and that's that the character's hearing impediment 
is an impediment <laughs> to you understanding the story. And the reason that I say that this is really important is really recently we've had a great film. We've had the film A Quiet Place that came out. And that was about a family that live in a world where you can't make noise. And through really good use of subtle subtitles, body language, and um, Amer- like American Sign Language, ASL, they communicated what was happening or what and it was very muted and body language was everything and what this game's live action scenes do is they go what if we just turn the sun off <laughs> so <laughs> like, <laughs> like li- literally and and what they oh, replace I'm... people's like like words with is like chimes so someone will be opening flapping their mouth and you're like <laughs> hang on can i can i like i I, it, I feel I understand perfectly. We're and not I also feel that this is, this is a shame. But so one of the characters is deaf. The main. The, the, yeah, yeah. So, oh, sorry. The main. The, ca- hang on. The main character is deaf. Yes. And is in an environment where people ask, are these people communicating with him? Yes. But the thing that. And they're, uh, they're doing nothing to. He can lip read. You can't. <laughs> Doesn't matter. He can. Wait, he's well, a, he's your bad boy for life. Like he he can do what he can do anything. He do subtitles he then. talks, and you can't hear what he says. <laughs> not only that, not only that. When there are scenes where that he isn't in, you can't hear what is happening. <laughs> Somebody's out in a car having a communication on the phone with somebody in a building on the place where your hero is trying to get. You can't hear that. His <laughs> deafness is yours. <laughs> and the bit that really is the icing on the cake is it is devoid completely of sound, barring the opening 30 seconds, which illustrates to you a very important thing. So our character, the thing that he does is he's good at punching man. Yeah. <laughs> like if you want man punched, my man will punch man. Yeah. And so he's also involved in this. He's got a friend who owns a club and I, I guess what's inferred, and please, please don't like try and hit me with your fucking theories about what's going on in this because it doesn't communicate it. And I don't think it's meant to be left up to interpretation on a point I'll get to later. But I assume that him and his friend that he has because was there when his mother got shot, rob drug dealers, right? And that seems to be what's going on. That's at least the initial setup. And um, and they're always against this one gang who's called Soul 33. S-O-L 33. Sounds like a 90s group. But this gang, they have an aesthetic. And the aesthetic that they have is not really on. And the aesthetic that they have is the same aesthetic that Antoine Farquhar likes to direct his films from. And that's Cholo as fuck. Like, it's the most Hispanic, ridiculous stereotype of a gang <laughs> that you could possibly ever see in your entire life. It is not, it's not chill. Like, the and the opening scene is literally someone just shouting the word puta over and over and over again until you get into the bit where you can't hear anything because your character puts a hand to his ear and goes, I'm deaf, mate. Still gone punch in the face, though. And he's still there, drugs. This is all wrapped into some sort of conspiracy where our main character is reminded of his dead mother by the girlfriend of his best friend who plays piano, which is what her mother did, which is, uh, I'm going to be honest, it falls very much into that kind of uh, anime pacing for cha- charitably it's, anime it's, pacing it's all live sorry I'm just fine just, I know so I really I'm want to explain to you what's going action. on with this game but let's talk about the game let's fuck the story because the story is bollocks and the game the game the game's really bad also <laughs> like 
like <laughs> fighting is really hard. It's like and the way that it transitions between live action and in game rendering, it's almost like imagine a fight in a real doll factory where people are just throwing real dolls against each other and holding them up behind their arms and jabbing them. <laughs> it's like nothing's got any weight. Like everyone's got this like vacant expression on their face. Like, like they don't want to be there. Like the, the enemies shamble on like a, like a zombie animation, which is meant to be <laughs> ready for a fight, but just like, looks like, the dead rising zombies <laughs> shambling towards you through them all. Wasn't the fighting done by someone involved in Yakuza? Yes. Yes. And do you know what? That. With how many Yakuza games they've been coming out lately, you can really see where that man's put his attention. <laughs> you know, like that's uh, that's because, you know, like Yakuza 6 just launched this year. Like it's I, I think it's. I don't think it's he designed the combat system. I think it's he gave a cursory eye to it because most of the development comes from Human Head Studios. Human Head Studios are famous for having made Prey. But then it should be amazing. No, because remember how they failed to make any video games since... Well, they were making Prey 2 and yeah, then they weren't allowed to make Prey 2. Because, because Chris Avalon is the best. Um, that, that actually isn't why. It's also because Arcane is the best. But, you know... That, yeah, that, but also because Bethesda's the worst. Let's not forget. Uh, that's true. They couldn't, they couldn't make the game and then another game became Prey yes, 2. Yes, but they were working with these people and these people... Literally, all they had to do was make a box and inside this very small box, a man is in it that you control and he punches people and that had to feel good. Yeah. It doesn't. My, my conceit that they can make something good, like, cause it, like when I stress this, it is difficult to play it. Like it's intuitive. The way the fights happen, that the motions of me connecting punches looks fluid, but spacing and um, kind of area management is like key, but there's no moves for it. So what's ha what happens is you get into, when you start to work the system and you start to get, you know, you start to get good at it, you like end up like laying two blows on a man in front of you, two blows to the man behind you. Then you realize someone's about to throw a punch. And what you do is you'll hold down the R trigger and run in a big circle around the room <laughs> Yeah, so you don't get clipped and then find the straggler that's come out of the group, then hit him. At least that's what I had to do playing it on hard mode. And I, I'm I, like, it was a bit of a test and I don't think it's balanced for it because of all of these reasons. But oh man, it's, it's just, it's just bad. And it's, it's also thinks it's amazing. You know, it constantly is like, um, oh, Aren't we amazing? The twists and turns come out of like. The Does it feel like a David Cage game? A little bit, yeah. Except, except with, but actually hit so much more into a Square Enix box, you know, like that, and and like that. I think it's the best, like kind of kind of, the best way to kind of look at it is the how it fails is amazing because everything that it's done to try and be interesting is in a disservice to forward like to selling you a particular idea or aesthetic and now like also it runs badly <laughs> so not only did i did i not enjoy playing it very much I also played through the entire game up to the last chapter. I played, and I was playing through the last chapter today. Got to the room before the last boss. And then the game booted me out. And then Sony took it upon themselves to monitor, to send me a message that says, yeah, we know this game is doing this. Can you send us an error report, please? I know we don't usually ask for these, but we need these for this game that just came out. I then sent that error message, then went back into the game, played uh, played from the beginning of this chapter, because you can only play from the start of the chapter, not the start of the fight. So played through another half hour. 
And then I thought I was at the last boss. And then it did that thing that games do. You know where it goes on and on. And this is why this is, I want, I want, I want props to this. I had to leave my house on the penultimate boss. Yeah. I didn't know it was. I thought it was the last boss at the time, but the (laughs) penultimate boss. Yeah. So I had to turn my PlayStation off. Nine, I'd have to play that whole chapter again. I went straight back from where I was to my house to play through to the end to all of this happened today (laughs) so that I had finished it so I could tell you this amazing thing (laughs) that happens at the end. So credits end and you find this amazing fucking pearl. Imogen Heap did the lack of soundtrack for it. (laughs) Yeah. She's written a song and she'll sing it. Yeah, for you. It's quite good. It sounds a little bit like her trying to do her really, really big song again, but like kind of not quite as good because it's for a video game and she doesn't really care. Um, <laughs> but then at the end of the game, it's a, it kind of goes like this. In the mists, there was confusion and chaos. But soon, there will be answers. This is text on the screen, right? And then a timer comes up, counting down five days, yeah, 20 hours, 39 minutes, and 47 seconds. And do you know what I know it is? It's the fucking patch that puts in the fucking dialogue so you can hear what the fuck everybody fucking says. And that's brilliantly what it is. Thus muting the entire point of absolutely fucking everything about the game. And having said all this, I'm fucking fascinated by it as an art, as a piece of art. It's fucking amazing. This is, this is such a weird fucking failed, um, proof of concept of a weird video game. Like, I have never, I could never recommend such a terrible product enough because I want people to share in my misery because (laughs) I don't know what, I don't know what happened today. (laughs) (laughs) Literally, it was just fucking mumblings of an insane author (laughs) fired at me through the meat like an insane author who isn't connected to the studio that made this half-baked fucking video game who just had this idea because once he was sick when he was little and played video games with children who were also ill i promise you i watch the interviews that is what he says it is. It's meant to replicate his feeling of non-verbal Wait, communication between him and people that he played video games with whilst he was in a hospital as a 15-year-old boy. And yes, it will do that in the way as you never looked at them and you just passed pad from side to side and didn't actually communicate and the game was the communication, then yes, that's what it is. When you said that, I thought you meant something else. (laughs) 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 So anyway, that's the quiet man I'm out. (laughs) Oh man, what a wonderful roller coaster of emotion you just put us on, Jay. Oh, I think that's that might be some of the finest podcasts we've ever had. <laughs> Good work, sir. Good work. Yeah, that's ten quid more spending. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, do you know what? When you told me the pitch for it, I was like, I really want this to be good. And you said no more. Yeah, and you're I know. A I've been ho- fucking. Yeah, well. I'm you're so been guarding how I feel about it for like my entire day. I will say this, yeah, like. <laughs> I um so I had some trials with this game anyway M- not really this game but more my internet connection and the flat has been fucking rubbish lately um and it keeps cutting out so I had to stay up till two o'clock like half past two actually yesterday like <coughs> like making sure my internet connection didn't die and then knowing exactly how long the game is and what I had to do today <laughs> waking up at half past eight so that I know that I could play it so that I would be relevant for this fucking podcast. That's how much fucking work that I put in. Yeah. And in the morning, I'm sitting there playing this game and Anna walks in, my girlfriend, and she looks over my shoulder and she sees this like live action and it's just like... (laughs) 
and then it's camera spins around in a dramatic fashion and then I'm like and then it's like me underwater punching a man like <laughs> boom, boom, boom. and she's just like what <laughs> literal shit is happening right now and unlike and this is the testament to this game unlike other games where she would just turn around and go okay cool video games I understand she went this looks so shit <laughs> came and sat on the corner <laughs> and was like, what's happening here? <laughs> what the fuck is going on in my living room? And I was like, oh, shit, he's deaf. He's just really going to punch a man. He, like, he really likes, he can't hear the piano, but he finds it comforting. And she was like, you know what, mate? You threw the fucking looking yeah. glass. <laughs> like, oh, beautiful. Well, <laughs> so maybe we need something a little bit calmer and better to kind of round off this episode of, of Game Face. So um, I think, did I talk about it last episode? I talked about Opus Magnum last I episode. I think, was it the last episode or the episode oh, maybe before? maybe the one before. I'm not sure and, uh, which. And apparently I convinced you to give it a go, Wayne. You did. Um, I was thinking of something to play um, before it occurred to me that I should play Di- Dicey Dungeons again. Um and I was like, oh, yeah, that game that Z talked about, like, last episode was... At least it sounded like the sort of thing that I might enjoy. Although, interestingly, I couldn't work out for the life of me how it was a game. In the sense that what you said, like, I remember it was something along the lines of, well, you have products and you have, you, you know... You, sorry, yeah, you have your reagents, you have your products... Mm-hmm. And you build things and you move them from A to B. And I was like, do this, bruv. It's done. Oh, uh, oh you, I, thought, I, you, I thought, you thought you could just click on them with I the mouse and yeah, move I them around? Yeah, I couldn't see ah. where the... Not even, like, click on them and move them around. I just couldn't see how much intricacy they could build into that as a concept. Aha. Uh-huh. And, and there... Because uh, I was like, well, there's got to be some sort of, like, restrictions on it. There's got to be some kind of difficulty there. Because if it's just throwing stuff together and chucking it in a box, then we're all good here. The restrictions are few. The, like, the game plays out on this, like... I mean... Infinite hex grid. P- part of the machine... Is it infinite? Yeah, I feel uh, like it's no, infinite. It's probably infinite. It's like, I mean, yeah. it's meant to be in maybe, his maybe living room. Maybe it's periodic. It's like... meant to be in his living room, but it's like, it seems that you can scroll forever. But um, but like but the things that you're moving around are referred to as atoms. So I assume they're so small. It's really, that really if, fucking effectively, small. Effectively, it's, it's semi-infinite. You can, you're, you can call they're it later infinite. referred to as marbles, though. Yeah, we, but that's... <laughs> a, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, but this... Um, but so you've got this hex grid and you've got arms that can move on this hex grid. Some of them can extend. Some of them can rotate. They all have a grab and a drop. Mm-hmm. Some of them can move along tracks as some well. Some of them can move along tracks as well. And so far, so piece of piss, right? You've got bonding things. And if the elements are over that, if two, if the elements are over each arm of this, they bond together. There's so few restrictions. But the couple that they have, one... Atoms are not allowed to occupy the same hex. Two atoms cannot occupy the same hex. They cannot move over or under one another. They, they, they collide it, it and that's it. You're fucked. Yeah. yeah. The other one sounds self-explanatory, but again, because it's only two-dimensional, um, you can't go through the um, arm itself. Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, that's not 100% true. No, the, the base of the arm you is what I mean. The base of that's so what you I mean to say. So you can't go through say. the base of the arm and you can't go through the, the end of the arm if it's holding something. Yeah, well, that's the atom itself, yes. right? So you can't go through an atom, you can't go through the base of the arm. Now, that sounds like obvious and very simple limits. The second that you get a number of things in play at once and have to start moving them all around and with this incentive that is nothing more than the fact they show you a fucking graph at the end oh it matters to get though. it done it in as few moves as possible suddenly it's the most geniusly fiendish fucking thing ever and you but want to make something that either you, that either like does it incredibly efficiently or or but it does so whilst looking amazing looks fucking gorgeous yeah you want something that just kind of like there's a i've already recorded a couple of gifts because it's just like oh my god look at why, it run you why, sort of press why, why haven't you sent them to me Ah, uh, well because i didn't want to ruin the fact that i was talking about it so it out it's fine 
I need to see. I need to see what I'm up against. <laughs> you could when you. Well, I mean, surely you're playing through it because I played far beyond where you got to when no, you lost. No, I, I, I slowed down. I I hit a mini game within the game and uh, didn't get beyond there. Yeah. So this is the this. So I've played it. I've played this game for about twelve hours so far. I've probably played the main thrust of the game for six of those at best because of. The mini game that they throw in, which is a Ma Yong variant called Sigmar's Garden. Again, on hex grids, you have the tiles that are, they're the atoms that you have in the thing. You get like four, four primary pairs of atoms, one sort of wild one, two that match with their opposite, and then one that matches on a kind of ladder. So you get five of one, and then you've got to match each one in so, turn. So the ladder one is is all of the is all of the metals in it, and you have to kind of combine it with quicksilver each time to get it to turn into a a better metal. So you start off with lead, and you go all the way through lots of metals until you end up with gold. So at which alchemy. Point, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the whole thing is alchemy. Yeah. Um. But it's this. It's this. Um. I don't understand alchemy, so I'm glad for that. that <laughs> it's, is it's, a all right. word it's all right. That I no understand. one does. It's not a real thing. That's <laughs> so probably you, why. You draw a symbol on the floor, put your hand on it, no, and then get a magic spear. Uh, equivalent uh, trade, Alan. Equivalent yes. trade. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Was I meant to bleed on my PC? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. Oh, that's uh, why what? I can't do the last level. Whilst in a circle of salt, did you. <laughs> Did you include the salt? Oh no, the circle of salt is the reagent anyway. No, right? Even if enough. you put, <laughs> you can't transmute a human, right? Like even if you put all the bits there, there's no accounting for the soul, Wayne. You're just twenty one grams. Twenty one grams. No man, Frankenstein. He had a soul. The monster. No, good call, dude. <laughs> no, he didn't. That's, That's the, the whole thing about the book. Like you, oh, you know what? I don't want to ruin the end of Frankenstein for people. Um, it's, uh, it's up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I, we think start, Frank, oh, I think we're beyond fucking 17th century spoilers <laughs> man I think you can ruin <laughs> Frankenstein for people at this point it's a, it's a really good book I don't want to it's a very good book it's, very like good it's book. fucking solid I mean my I, it's got some interesting I'm not, things I, to okay, say I'm not, I'm not even going to start on the discussion before we get more <laughs> Wayne talks about this game again tick marks um, so no but it basically, it, there's an achievement for winning a hundred games of this. And I've got to ten. I'm on thirty-eight. I mean, like fucking hell. Once, <laughs> once, once I worked out what was going on. Once I like kind of got got into the zone with this thing. Like ma- managed to managed to find the right pace to actually work out enough moves ahead and get a sort of intuitive sense of what's going on to know when that needed to be done, when it didn't. I I felt like I can just play and win them. And, and it's, it does and it's fuck you occasionally, relaxing. though. I, like, yeah, occasionally, I, 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 I'll sort of win three on the trot, and then fifty percent for like six games, and then another batch. Mm-hmm. I think I'm running, but it's it does fuck you sometimes. And sometimes I win a few on the trot, and then I get really complacent. I'm like, yeah, this game's piss, and I just start clicking shit. And then it's like, <laughs> so the question is, is, is this? Is it good? No, <laughs> no, that isn't my question. Okay, it's, good. What is which game is better? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Like this is like really coming. Like this is coming across to me. Listening to you like talk about both of them, both of you, is it seems like both of them have so many strong merits. I wouldn't own Sigma's Garden if it wasn't for Opus Magnum. O- Opus Magnum is is a more interesting game. There's a lot more going on with it. Like there's a lot more artistry to it. Like it is better designed and more intricate and there are lots of different ways of solving the problems in it so it ends up being an exercise of creativity as well sigmar's garden requires less thinking it doesn't it takes less from you but that means i've been playing more of it because i've been fucking exhausted when i want to play play video games and i find it super relaxing just to match up pairs of things in the right order does sigmar's garden have lovely music because it feels like it should yes but also, I've been listening to audiobooks whilst I've been playing. Oh, okay. I it. know. Uh, it, it's. I mean, it's the not a very. It's not a very long loop, but it's just one of those chilled, ambient, chimey loops like a that hexic goes. Hexic vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like a hexic vibe, and and so like my take, I wouldn't have played. I wouldn't have got Sigmar's Garden without 
Opus Magnum. I see them as a package Wait, in the way can that I say, they're... Wayne, I'm really happy that you like it as much as I did because I felt like I was being a bit of a rubbish brokered human by liking Sig Fast Gun as much as I did. <laughs> I like... um, no, every every time I, I do a level and then I play like five levels of Sig Fast <laughs> and then I do another. And the part, secret Sig Fast Gun. And part of the reason for this is because the game itself doesn't have that many levels and as good as it is i know i won't go back to it and finish like get the 100 wins that i need if i finish opus magnum it's like it is one of those like really great like chilled games and i can i have turned opus magnum on just to play sigma's garden <laughs> i have <laughs> But I know I won't when it moves out of the thing that's on rotation. So is it sort of like when you finish a level of Opus Magnum, like your hot reward is <laughs> Sigma <Sigma's> Sky? <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting though because I'm a big fan of like. Do you remember? You remember Project Gotham Racing? I mean, Fuck I mean, I don't, I don't remember that. I want to play Geometry yeah, Wars forever. <laughs> <laughs> like, All I remember is Geometry Wars. Yeah, exactly. Like, I didn't realize Geometry wrong. Wars was part of Project Gotham. It's the Gotham. loading screen for Project Gotham Racing. So Geometry what? Wars, the standalone, I didn't, I, is the sequel to the original original Geometry Wars, which was the loading screen, the loading screen for, Project for Project Gotham. Gotham. And, like, and like, honestly, I've never been hit by a case of, I want to play that game more than I have with that. <laughs> is that? I mean, Gwent's good, but so the witcher right yeah but i hear the standalone for gwent is rubbish um are they've so they've like just released it as like a full full standalone because they were they were kind of gwent existed on its own for a while and it'd been in beta for ages but they seem to have like made a full campaign story out of it which is about playing gwent to battle your way through various things that's not it's not gwent it's a like new variant of it we're talking about throne breaker right yes couldn't be more gassed don't have a PC, so I'll talk about that in December. All right. <laughs> I mean, like, I obviously don't have time to play it, so I don't know. Yeah. Apparently it's good. But hey. Right, um, folks, I think we've been going for a while. So are there more things that you wish to say about Opus Magnum or can we wrap up? No, right? no, no, wrap up. If there's more to say, I'll say it another day. Okay, sweet. We'll both play some more. We'll come back. We'll reconvene at a later date. Oh, You're actually, I, I will. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> talks at the same time. <laughs> No, I, I will very quickly say one thing because it hasn't been mentioned at all by either of us, I don't <laughs> think. Um, because there is this really nice, well, not nice, but really interesting and well-delivered story throughout. Like the levels oh, are based I, I did, around... I did mention it. I did mention it. Based when around I was, these stories. Um, and although they're really like quite small and they're text-based... They're really interesting. And I'm actually gripped by that as well. I, I, that, so I, there's another string to its bow. I think that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the characters that they have are more interesting and initially more sort of, I don't know, like like grounded than you normally get in video games. Yes. And like that, that is something that I often appreciate as a uh, as a sort of palate cleanser to the save the world nonsense that's normally going on, right? Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, it's it's good in lots of ways. Um, anyway, um, I really need the loo, so let's finish. Um, so, um, uh, you can find um, us on Facebook, Twitter, um, on YouTube, um, and on our website, tastemygameface.com. And the links to all of those other places are at tastemygameface.com slash contacts. Um, we'd also be really nice if you could join us on the Discord. I put lots of links and bits and pieces there. Um, I think we're producing a lot more on Twitter these days, sort of pointing out the things that we find interesting about the internet there as well. So so come and follow us if you are interested in the things that you think we might be interested in. Um, if you do enjoy our podcast, it's always super helpful for us if you recommend us to other people who you think might be interested. Um, and also, we've had uh, Games Your Dad Likes going on on YouTube. So we've got lots of interesting Let's Plays. Have the Silent Hill episodes started yeah, turning up, up yeah? Yeah, 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 they're up now. Like they're starting to go. You can watch us fail. <laughs> Fail to Silent Hill. Yeah, that's yeah, definitely happening. Yeah, the piano adventure should be up. Oh, it's the piano adventure. Like. Yeah, I mean, like honestly, if I if I'm gonna sell it, really, is you see how annoyed I get about things, right? You've listened to this podcast. You know how I get annoyed about things. I've been doing it this episode. If you want to see that at one puzzle, 
<laughs> for 45 minutes then our silent hill let's play is probably for you <laughs> like, like I'm fucking in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So um, in that case, um, this has been episode 89 of Taste My Game Face. I've been Azizi Adiemo. I've been Wayne James. I've been Joe Knight. I've been Alan Heath. And we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>